Hi, I'm Kai Ladd from the School of Ocean Sciences at Bangor University. I'm standing here on the edge of the Menai Strait, a narrow strip of sea that separates Anglesey from the Welsh mainland. Behind me, you can see the magnificent Telford Suspension Bridge. And before its completion in 1826, crossing the Menai Strait was a dangerous undertaking. And that was in no small measure because of a natural phenomenon that occurs all over the world. An event that, here especially, is a daily reminder of the drama and the power of nature. I'm talking, of course, about the tides. At its greatest range, the tides here can rise and fall over seven metres. The large movement of water through the narrow strait at this point creates whirlpools and surges, earning this stretch its infamous name, the swellies. Sailors here have to be careful to get their tide times right. A mistake could lead to a cold bath. Luckily, the tides are very predictable, one of the most predictable phenomena in nature. But where does all this water come from? What makes the tides, and why are there two a day? These were questions that puzzled scientists for centuries, and it wasn't until the famous physicist Sir Isaac Newton came along and solved the great mystery. Newton found the answer between the Earth and the Moon. There is a common misconception that the Moon spins around the Earth, but actually, these two heavenly bodies are spinning around each other, like two figure skaters holding hands whilst dancing on the ice. One spin, or orbit, takes about 27 days, which is how we get our calendar month. Because Earth is nearly four times the size of the Moon, the centre of mass between them isn't in the middle, but actually lies just below the Earth's surface. Because of this, our orbit at this point is much less obvious than that of the Moon's. This orbit is enough to generate strong centrifugal forces that would pull the two dancers apart. However, the attraction of gravity between them balances the centrifugal force and holds them together in their spin. The centrifugal forces on Earth all pull with the same magnitude away from the Moon, but the attraction of gravity in the opposite direction is strongest nearest to the Moon and weakest on the opposite side of the Earth. These forces have their most obvious effect on the water that covers our Earth. Gravity pulls it towards the Moon on one side, and the centrifugal forces pull it away from the Moon on the other, warping the oceans into the shape of a rugby ball. The two bulges are our high tides, and the two low tides are here, where there is less water. So that's the first part of the puzzle. But it doesn't explain why the tides rise and fall twice a day under the Telford Suspension Bridge. If the only thing we had to consider was the orbit of the Earth and the Moon around each other, then we'd only get two high tides and two low tides per month. To understand why there are daily tides, we need to throw another celestial movement into the mix. The spinning of the Earth on its axis. Because this spin is unrelated to the forces pulling the oceans, it effectively takes place underneath the bulges of water. One spin of the Earth is one day, so that means any one point on the Earth's surface, like Telford's Bridge, passes through two low tides and two high tides a day. But let's not forget the orbit of the Earth and the Moon around one another. Opposing forces pull the Earth's oceans to make the tides, but it also affects something else. It makes the times of the tides slightly different each day. In the same time the Earth has spun on its axis, the Earth and Moon have moved a fraction in their orbit, taking the distorted oceans with them. So every day, Telford's Bridge takes a bit longer to catch up. But how much longer? Based on what you've heard so far in this video, see if you can work out the daily difference in tide times. Once Newton had explained the physics of the tides, the next generation of scientists were able to question its role in another worldwide event, the meridional overturning circulation. This circulation is simply the movement of water from the tropics to the poles and back again. It is driven in part by differences in the water's temperature at these points. It connects the surface ocean and atmosphere with the cold, deep sea. As such, it's critical in regulating the Earth's climate. Let's pretend this tank is the world's ocean. At the tropics, the water is warmed by the sun. At the North Pole, the water is cooled by the ice caps. But when we add dye to each end, the warm tropical water flows to the pole, 
and the cold water there sinks and flows back along the sea floor towards the tropics. But after a while, the circulation stops. If this were to happen in the oceans, they would be left stagnant and unmoving. But studies of deep ocean currents tell us this is not the case, and that something else is maintaining the overturning circulation. What could it be? This time, it was scientists Walter Munk and Carl Wunsch who unravelled the mystery, and not until 1998. Like Newton, they found the answer high in the sky. Munch and Wunsch showed that the moon and its tide generating forces deliver enough energy to stir the ocean. This action is enough to draw up water from the cool depths of the tropics, to be warmed by the sun again and keep the circulation going. So we can see from this experiment that the tides are more than just the daily rise and fall of water along our coast. They impact on much deeper global ocean processes.